Welcome to our home, friends. As you can see, we're shooting this lesson number seven from the comforts of our living room and are very glad that you've decided to join us. Making Firm the Foundation is a 20 lesson series of very interesting Bible topics. We start in Genesis, we give the viewer an overall purpose of God's plan and show the timetable that covered 7,000 years. Then we jump right into the first topic of creation and we take you through 20 lessons to the end of the Bible hitting the highlights and uh, concentrating on those first fundamental principles that make up the foundation of the original faith that Jesus taught to his apostles. We encourage you to ask questions which you can direct to the address below this site. So let's get started with our first present lesson and that is Lesson 7 Joshua the Conquest of Canaan and the Period of the Judges. We're now entering a new phase in the development of God's plan. Moses, the great leader and lawgiver, is required to relinquish his command because of his disobedience at Meribah. When he smote the rock, you may recall, instead of speaking to it, to bring water forth for the people. God chooses Joshua now to lead his people into the land of promise. The history of the conquest of Canaan and the period of the judges is a story of the ebb and flow of the fortunes of Israel in their repeated rebellion and repentance. This lesson is a remarkable demonstration of God's long-suffering and mercy. A Phillips atlas or really any Bible atlas or you can use a search engine on your computer or your mobile device and it'll be very helpful in illustrating the division of the land among the tribes. On our 7,000 year plan you'll notice the two bold lines that uh, vertical lines down the center of the plan. This shows the period of the judges that we'll be covering. It's about dead center to the overall 7,000 year plan of God. Turning to Deuteronomy 31, verses 14 through 23, we write what I've entitled, Moses Writes the Blues. Starting in verse 14, we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua, and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, and that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it the children of Israel, Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten, and filled themselves, and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods, and serve them, and provoke me, and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed, for I know their imagination which they go about even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day, and taught it the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. So now you know why I entitled it Moses Writes the Blues. It was a song, and he was to teach it to them, evidently because songs are easy to remember. And this was something that he wanted, God wanted Joshua and Moses and the children of Israel to keep in mind, that God foreknew by his omniscience 
his foreknowledge of all things he foreknew ahead of time that Israel would soon go astray from the covenant that he had made with them at Mount Sinai. In Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, we read, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Well, in this verse, we're given Joshua's qualifications for leadership. It seems quite fitting that in verses 10 through 12, there should be a testimonial to the qualities of leadership in Moses, the great prophet, whom the Lord knew face to face. It'll be profitable for you to refer in this connection to Exodus 33, verses 17 through 23, and Numbers 12, verses 7 through 8, which I will leave at your discretion to read. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, we read, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not be there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. The Hebrew translation of the name Joshua is Yah saves. This was Jesus' Hebrew name. The Greek name of Jesus being equivalent to the Hebrew Joshua. The introduction to this book takes the form of a commission to Joshua to lead his people from the wilderness to their inheritance in the land. Verse 6 is a partial fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant was not conditional but the promise of a continuance of God's blessing to Israel in the land was conditional. In Acts 7, verse 2 through 5, we read of the unfaithfulness of Israel, which did not invalidate the promises that God made to Abraham. Verse 2, And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Quran. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Quran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land, wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So we can see in Stephen's words in the book of Acts a reiteration of this very promise that God had made to Abraham regarding the land, and yet they were in the land when Stephen spoke these words, or they had returned from the Babylonian captivity. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, we read, Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, this day, or today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, referring to Joshua, had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So the author is telling us that it wasn't Joshua bringing them into the land that was the fulfillment of the promise, but that there was a greater rest in the future. And that rest, of course, was an allusion to the kingdom of God when Jesus, the greater Joshua, shall bring the Jews from all over the world back to the land of promise and set them up under an uh, administration of immortal saints who will rule with Jesus Christ on the earth as kings and priests. 
Now, the writer of the Hebrews specifically states that this rest that Israel received under, under Joshua's administration was not the rest that God had in mind as the promise made to Abraham. Joshua did not give the people the rest of the seventh day, as we mentioned. It is yet to come, for David, many years later, spoke in anticipation of it. This chapter emphasizes the true rest that will take place under a greater Joshua, that of King Jesus during his millennial reign. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, the far block to the, to the far right, the purple block, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. It's uh, highlighted with the large red arrow, speaking or referring to the kingdom age. In Joshua chapter 2, we read of the period of the conquest of Canaan, which took him nearly 10 years to finally drive out most of the tri uh, tribes of Canaan, but they unfortunately left several in the land because they didn't fight back and were peaceful. How often that, does that get us in trouble? In Joshua 3, verses 14 through 17, we read, And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as they that bear the Ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city of Adam. That is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. This chapter describes the crossing of the Jordan River and the entrance into the land. A point of interest is found in verses 14 through 17 where, in spite of flood conditions which always took place at harvest time, the people passed over on dry ground. Well, this was obviously a repetition or an echo on a smaller scale of the crossing of the Red Sea. It's remarkable that Israel's journey started with the crossing through water on dry ground at the Red Sea and terminated in the same manner. In Joshua 6, we read of the conquest of the city of Jericho. Verses 1 through 3, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So, viewers, we read here that this is the first victory, and it came with the fall of a strategic Canaanite fortified very fortified city of Jericho. The organization and restraint of God's people that we noticed during this siege of Jericho is really a marvelous lesson in obedience and faith, for without it, God would never have brought the walls down and given Joshua and the children of Israel the victory. The spies, as you see in this slide, are leaving Rahab's uh, house in Jericho. And... Um, the sinful city of Jericho was judged by God through the Israelites. The seemingly impenetrable walls were collapsed by a miracle. Just to touch on the, on the spies, if you're not familiar with this account, Joshua sent in two spies, not twelve as Moses had done forty years later. But Joshua sends in the two spies. They enter the city of Jericho through the gates at night. And they go to a prostitute's home by the name of Rahab. She lived on the wall. 
homes in those days were built within and, and, and within the, the, the walls, the fortified walls that gave them a structure to start with. And these spies made a covenant upon Rahab's insistence if she were to hide them, which she did from the authorities who sent out soldiers to find them. And these two spies were hidden up on top of Rahab's house on her uh, uh, roof where she dried out flax uh, for making linen. And um, Rahab sent them the other way, sent the uh, authorities and soldiers the other way and let down these spies out of a window later to escape back to um, the uh, encampment of the Israelites. But when she did, she was so faithful to know that this people of Israel were about to take over Jericho and the land of Canaan. And she even told the spies that the heart of the people of the land are trembling because of you. So I want you to make a covenant with me, she told them, and my family to save me and my household. And friends, if you haven't made a covenant on the basis of the gospel that Jesus taught, you might want to think about that. Like Rahab, have enough faith to know that what God has promised in his word and prophesied it and confirmed it with great miracles, he's going to do. We can be fully assured of that. Now, if you want to take uh, bets against that, and try to survive this, this next 40 to 50 years on your own without his help. Good luck with that. Moving on. You know, you can pull up archaeologist reports on their um, uncovering the things in the Bible lands. And um, the archaeologist spade will turn up the truth of the Bible inevitably. There's the uh, Associates for Biblical Research, Bryant Wood, who's a man standing in this picture next to a section of the collapsed wall of Jericho. I'll read you a little bit here about him. As Wood went on to point out, John Garstang in 1930 to 1936 and Kathleen Kenyon from 52 to 58 both dug at Jericho for six seasons and a German excavation directed by Ernst Sellen and Carl Watzinger dug for three seasons. All of them found abundant evidence of the city's destruction by fire in a layer related to the biblical date of 1400 BCE. In September 1997, Dr. Wood of the ABR visited Jericho and examined the results of the Italian excavation firsthand. Incredibly, he found the Italians had uncovered the stone outer revetment wall at the base of the tell with part of the mud brick wall built on top of it still intact. In the book of the Italian excavation at the outer base of the revetment wall, Wood noticed the remains of the collapsed mud brick city walls which had tumbled. Not only did the Italians find the same evidence uncovered in the earlier excavations, it fits the biblical story perfectly. Wood reports the following. The Italian excavation actually uncovered most of the critical evidence relating to the biblical story. But even more exciting is the fact that all the evidence from the earlier digs has disappeared over time. We only have records, drawing, and photos. But the Italians uncovered a completely new section of the wall which we did not know still existed. I had my photograph taken standing next to the wall where the mud brick collapse had just been excavated. And that was the previous slide. Unfortunately, the Italian archaeologists, the Palestinian authorities, the Associated Press, and most of the world doesn't realize any of this. It is a sad commentary on the state of archaeology in the Holy Land when the purpose of an excavation at a biblical site is to disprove the Bible and disassociate the site with any historical Jewish connection. Friends, if you find anything on, uh, by Dr. Lean Rittmeyer, uh, of Wales, who is an archaeologist, uh, a very published and renowned archaeologist who has written for the Bar Magazine, as well as Dr. Stephen Collins. Both of these men keep a Bible in one hand and the spade in the other. And I believe you can depend on most, if not all, of their findings to confirm the Bible record. Let's move on. In Joshua chapter 7 through 13, 
These describe Joshua's military campaigns. In Joshua 10, verse 5, we read, Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, now these are the Canaanite tribes, the king of Jerusalem, which was still under the control of Canaanites, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their host, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp, to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us, and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. And really it was actually Joshua's obligation because he had made a covenant. Unbeknownst to him, these Gibeonites were actually Canaanite citizens dressed in disguise of men who had come from a foreign land and wanted to make a covenant telling Joshua that they were from a faraway land and not to worry, we're not from this place. And they were lying and Joshua failed to uh, consult um, Yahweh, God, the God of Israel, for the truth. Otherwise he would have gotten it, no doubt. But as it was, Joshua had made the covenant and now the men of Gibeon are set upon by these kings of the Canaanites who want to kill the Gibeonites for making a covenant. And of course they appeal to Joshua to help them fight. Jumping to Joshua 14, one interesting observation in connection with this chapter is that the land that was divided by Lot fits exactly in the pattern of the prophecy that's contained in the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons which can be found in Genesis 49. You might, you might want to take a look at that and uh, peruse that chapter uh, of these uh, divisions of the land. Now other nations that uh, inhabited the land of Canaan were Canaanites, of course, Hittites, Philistines, Phoenicians, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Midianites. Um, King Herod in the New Testament, we'll find, uh, was an Edomite and uh, really in the wrong place as far as being a king of Israel. Moving on, the 12 tribes of Israel that displaced these Canaanite tribes by Joshua's hand and Yahweh's power, Manasseh, Naphtali, Issachar, from Benjamin, Simeon, Asher, Zebulun, Gad, Dan, Reuben, Judah, sons of jo Jacob, as we mentioned earlier, that developed into the tribes. Joshua 24, 29. And after these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the slave of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the mountain of Gaash. So this verse records the death of Joshua. His life was an outstanding example of faithful dedication to God's laws. In Joshua 24:32, we read, that the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel had brought up out of Egypt. Now, keep in mind, just pause here a moment. They took this massive sepulcher. Uh, how much of it, we don't know. But it must have been quite a sled that they dragged Joseph's bones on, uh, carried them perhaps on a cart. Uh, we're not sure of the mode of transportation, but they would have brought Joseph's bones as he told them to do upon exiting or the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt and carried them all this way. And what happened? They buried them in Shechem in the part of the field which Jacob bought. Joseph's father, Jacob, buys this land back in Genesis from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, and that was before all of the Shechemites were slain by Simeon and Levi. He bought this land from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred ewe lambs, and it became the inheritance of the sons of Joseph. So that's naturally where Joseph wanted to be buried. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in the hill of Phinehas, his son, which was given to him in the mountain of Ephraim. So these patriarchs are falling asleep and being buried in their resting places to await the resurrection. Now, in verse 32, we find the record of the burial of the bones of Joseph. When we follow the narration, we marvel at the circumstances under which each step of the journey brought Joseph's remains closer and closer to its final resting place. 
His burial took place in the parcel of ground which Jacob had previously purchased from the people of the land. Surely it was not coincidence, but design, that the lot of inheritance fell to the children of Joseph. Now we leave Joshua, the book of Joshua, and go into the book of Judges. First chapter, the book of Judges, covers approximately 400 years. Keeping that in mind as a little background, the following is a brief outline sufficient to illustrate the history of this period. When Israel inherited the land, it was divided among the tribes by lot. There was no capital city and no central government. Some of the tribes became isolated and there was very little communication between them. As you can see on the map of the slide, during the time of Joshua, Israel was faithful to God, but later there was a falling away to idolatry. God punished them through raids and warfare with the surrounding nations. There were times when one portion of the land might be secure and at peace, while yet another area might be invaded and at war. In the book of Judges, we see that these were men, and a woman in particular, were raised up by God to rescue them from, from their, their enemy whenever they repented of their transgressions. Israel's history during this period swings like a pendulum between unfaithfulness and repentance. In the slide, you can see an illustration of um, Samson and Delilah courting, as it were, over the um, floor rug of the lion that, that um, Samson had slain. I find that an interesting artist interpretation of that scene. Very good art. Continuing, it is interesting to note that the judges were not selected from any particular tribe, but came from several tribes and different walks of life. God chose them to meet the requirements of a particular circumstance. Outstanding examples are Samson, who we saw earlier, and Gideon. The administration of the judges, in some cases, overlap. There were, in some areas, long periods of peace and prosperity, as shown in the book of Ruth. Here is a uh, sequence of events in the life of Samson, starting to the far right. We see uh, the location of where Samson marries a Philistine woman. He's betrayed by her kin and, and friends, and he exacts his revenge by burning down their grain fields and olive yards, vineyards. And then you jump over to uh, the second from the left at the top, number two, the, he, where he slew 30 men. So he leaves town, he, he slays 30 men, takes their garments and brings them back to this wedding night uh, to pay off a debt for them solving a riddle by uh, coercing his bride. And um, so he lost that bet, but he, 30 men lost, 30 Philistines lost their lives. Then you jump to uh, the far left, number three, Samson is captured by the Philistines while staying at Gaza. And down to number four on the right, the bottom, Samson escapes Gaza, flees to Hebron with the city gate on his shoulders. Um, and then number five at the top in the middle, Delilah, he meets and she betrays him. Uh, and then he's taken by the Philistines to Gaza and blinded. And then finally, number six on the far left lower corner, Samson destroys the temple of Dagon, killing himself and numerous Philistines. Quite a dramatic lifetime. And uh, every young person should read the life of Samson, especially if you have tendencies to be a party animal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's an it's a extraordinary lesson, one I had to learn the hard way, and I sure, certainly hope you do not, young people, and even middle-aged and older people, think before you become a party animal that ends up blind and dead. Okay, the historical record. It points up the more dramatic parts when certain tribes were under great pressure. Their deliverance after repeated provocation is an amazing demonstration of God's patience. It's important for us viewers to realize the instability of the tribes during this period of the judges and 
God's love and concern for his people. Yeah, the book reads like a sordid novel. Um, sometimes mystery, war, sex. It, it's the lowest point in Israel's history, it seems like. Maybe not, but uh, it seems like it when you read through the book of Judges. But it, through all of that, God's love and concern for his people is manifested, realized. And he didn't forget the covenant that he made with the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he brought Israel through this most difficult period. And like we said earlier, it's like a, a clock pendulum back and forth or up and down the mountains and, and valleys of the shadow of death. It's uh, really a dramatic book to read. I encourage you to read the whole thing. Now, we jump to Samuel. And... Uh, we mentioned Ruth, which is a little short book um, about an extraordinary Gentile woman, uh, a Moabite. Um, I want you to read that one too. But now we get into Samuel. Now Samuel was the last judge of Israel and certainly the most influential. You want to pay, pay close attention to the account of his birth and introduction into the house of Eli when he was a child. After Eli's death, Samuel just took over Eli's duties. One of the greatest works that Samuel accomplished was the formation of what's called the School of the Prophets. He taught selected men the ways and laws of God, and through them erected a bulwark against the spirit of idolatry, which was so prevalent in Israel at that time. And it wasn't going away anytime soon, unfortunately. But Samuel was an extraordinary figure, as we've mentioned. So the prophets lived in these schools or in a communal life, and these were great colleges that were held in great respect by the people because they were turning out qualified men to help Samuel teach the people, unlike some schools. Samuel traveled from school to school, residing for a time in the cities and towns in which they were established. Some of the notable centers of education you'll find were Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, Ramah. You can use an atlas or search engine for a visual aid in locating these cities. The aim of these schools, remember, was to influence the political and religious life of the people of Israel and keep them strong in their daily mundane routines by recalling the Word of God. Not everyone had very, very few, if anybody, had written parchments of the record of the, of the law of Moses that was given at Sinai or the, or the books that Samuel wrote, like the judges and others. So, but they had the teachings that they could memorize uh, from these men like Samuel and the men of the school of the prophets. And you see how they're, they're, they're close in proximity to the city of Jerusalem. Next we see a, a, a map of um, the, the red circular line shows the circuit preaching of Samuel and the inset here is Samuel anointing Saul. Samuel anointed Saul prince over Israel. We say king, but really as Samuel told the children of Israel who demanded a king, they already had a king. Why would they want a human king when they had a divine king like God, Yahweh, the king of Israel? But they insisted, and Yahweh uh, gave Sam, Samuel the green light. And he anointed a man who God actually provided for them to satisfy what he knew would be their own lust of the eyes, the flesh, and pride of life. Here's a king that can lead us out and bring us in and lead us into battle, and we can praise him and glorify him. I mean, after all, the children of Israel said to Samuel, all the other nations have kings. We should have a king. Peer pressure. We never get away from it, whether individual teens or nations like Israel succumbing to peer pressure when, in fact, they had the greatest king any nation could ever have. And they are yet to recognize that. <laughs> Sorry, Israel, but it's coming. You'll recognize it. And the scales will fall from your eyes. And your Messiah will be revealed unto you. So we're going to leave Samuel here as the strongest personality in Israel. He's a kingmaker. 
under God's direction, of course, because later we, he anoints David. And uh, so that we're going to see the introduction of a man who loved God and um, made a wonderful king, notwithstanding his failures. But we can all relate to that. We will see a strong influence when we take up our next subject in Lesson 8, when we see Samuel anointing David king in what will be called the kingdom period. So until then, I bid you goodbye, and we'll see you hopefully again in our next lesson, lesson number eight, the kingdom period. Thanks for viewing, viewers, and we'll see you again.